We now have the panel titled, The Digital Future of Healthcare, Will New Models of Care Deliver Meaningful Improvements in Patient Outcomes? In this panel, we will assess the opportunities for improvements that digitization can bring to healthcare, and particularly the challenges that need to be overcome before digital tools will have widespread adoption. Examples of digital innovations in healthcare include home care, e-health, mobile health, self-care, and of course, artificial intelligence. Many of these technologies are yet to deliver on their promise as there have been very few gold standard clinical trials that back up the hype. I think some of this uh, illustrates some of the challenges unique to healthcare and raises questions about the implementation of digital technologies in this sector. How do we create an evidence base for digital technologies which are dynamic and iterative by nature and therefore may not be suited to the time consuming nature of long term effectiveness studies? Additionally, how can we ensure equitable care coverage when expensive consumer devices become integral parts of modern care plans? Who will pay for these technologies and who will own them? I guess essentially, how do we bring healthcare into the digital, into the digital age in a way that actually helps patients? Moderating this panel will be Sophie Hackford. Sophie is well versed in the power of digital disruption, having launched and run the consulting business of Wired Magazine, a publication with a focus on emerging technologies. Before this, Sophie spent two years in the Silicon Valley with Singularity University, a group focused on harnessing exponential technologies. She is currently undertaking a personal project, traveling amongst weirdos and troublemakers and creative communities to investigate emerging technologies. She has kindly taken time out of her schedule to share knowledge with us. Joining Sophie will be Dr. Jushan Chowdhury, Ram Fish, Dr. Nicholas Hinke, and Dr. Graham Spittle, and I'll now hand over to Sophie to introduce this distinguished panel. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, um, Hamish. And so we're going to talk, as you just heard, about digital health, which I've kind of loosely defined as the kind of clash between healthcare um, and, and technology more broadly, not just the kind of concept of digital. I think there's always a bit of a danger that we try and think just about digitizing the analog world. And actually, I think the importance should be on what are the services and technologies of the future that we can actually uh, achieve improvements in healthcare um, that we couldn't do in the analog world, we couldn't do uh, in the past, and that's what I'm particularly excited about. And of course, um, no industry is safe. You snooze, you lose, as they say. Um, finance, entertainment, the autonomous vehicles that are moving into the auto industry, every industry is uh, undergoing a huge reimagining in the face of technology. And yet, if you look at education, you look at politics, and specifically today, of course, you look at healthcare, these are all industries that are kind of under-disrupted at the moment. Um, and there's a good reason for that, I think, um, in the sense that there is, of course, a life and death aspect um, to what all you guys do and, and what the healthcare industry looks like. But of course, consumers, citizens, are all getting much more used to uh, using technology in their everyday lives, and so their expectations are, of course, changing as well. So today, I want to explore with the panel um, what are those accelerating technologies that are changing the face of healthcare. And I'm hoping that we're going to cover a bit of robotics, a bit of virtual reality, um, some, more, some uh, artificial intelligence, um, some voice interface stuff, perhaps, um, but also some ethics and regulation and the kind of skills and leadership that's needed to be able to take us um, in the next decade or so and hopefully spark some of the controversy and excitement that we've got um, uh, out of the last, uh, the last panel. So I'm going to ask now each of our panelists um, to talk just for a couple of minutes about their approach um, to digital healthcare, their approach to technology, uh, and why they think it's an exciting time um, to be in that business. Should we start with you, Graham? OK, thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Graham Spittle, and uh, currently Vice President for Competitive Technology for IBM. Uh, I've spent sort of nearly 30 years in R&D in IBM, uh, starting off in this country in, uh, in Winchester down the road here. Uh, I joined there as a software guy, and I've spent most of my career in software in, in IBM. Uh, many years later, I ended up running the Hursley Laboratory with 3,500 engineers there. Moved to the US for a while, did a tour, first tour of duty there on, uh, on strategy. Uh, came back to the UK. Um, I've been CTO for IBM in Europe, and now I spent, spent three years up until last year in America, and now I'm sort of spending uh, half my time in the UK, half my time in the US on competitive technology. Um, my interest in the intersection between IT and, uh, and health <coughs> happened many years ago. I, coincidentally, here in Oxford, uh, I, I met Mike Brady, um, who was working on imaging. And uh, he had a problem, and he was trying to solve uh, digital mammography. And he approached me when I was running Hursley about what can we do with the computation. 
So I started to work with uh, Mike and the team here on a project called eDiamond. And that sort of whetted my appetite, and I suddenly understood how all of these things could fit together. So ever since then, I've become sort of pathologically interested in, uh, in health and, and computing. Uh, I have to confess, I'm a hopeless optimist when it comes to technology. Uh, you know, as a kid, I liked to build hi-fi. It shows how old I am, because nobody even talks about hi-fi. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I ran the UK uh, Technology Strategy Board for seven years, and I'm in the process of helping the Medical Research Council right now set up a new national institute here in the UK for medical informatics. So it's kind of where my interest comes. Very good, thank you. Jishan. Uh, so my name's Jishan. I run a software based out, I'm sorry, a startup based in San Francisco. And we use a combination of software and machine learning to augment clinical teams for what we call superhuman care. And by superhuman, I mean two things. So one, we're not, we're not replacing humans, we're augmenting them. And, we're not, and in that way, I like saying that we're not building a robot so much as an exoskeleton. So how can we help humans do better what they're already doing? And by that, I also mean that we want to achieve a level of reliability and access that is just simply impossible with the variation that's inherent with humans um, and the bias that's inherent with humans. Uh, and I think that's the most exciting, um, for me, one of the most exciting things about this wave of digital technology is that we can finally use technology not just to add to cost, because if you look previously, like as much as aging gets the fault for the increasing costs that we see in our healthcare system, one of the biggest components is technology has typically added to our costs and not decreased them. And I think this wave of digital health finally has this potential to allow us to do more with less. And just to briefly say how, how we do that is that we have a platform that allows clinical teams to do what they do, which is talk to each other. And it's used in places as broadly from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston to Grudeskir in Cape Town. And by just looking at the sheer volume of communications that are happening in a hospital, you can imagine in a hospital is a place where there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of moving people. Um, that there's a lot of noise there, but we can take this noise and this data and actually, by applying unstructured machine learning techniques to it, translate that into actual knowledge and useful, um, actionable insights. And, and that varies from by listening to teams and observing teams being able to predict which of their patients are going to deteriorate and need to go to the ICU, <clears throat> to simple as listening to what doctor and nurse are saying and then realizing this patient's gonna likely go home tomorrow. I'm not gonna bother the doctor and nurse to call the uh, patients, a loved one, to have them picked up, picked up tomorrow, I'll just do that automatically. I'll learn that the patient's ready to go home tomorrow, and the machine will reach out to the family to do that. And so like, you can do very complex things to very simple things to improve care. And again, I think that's the real excitement for me right now is that we can take, we don't have to add new sensors or new um, therapeutics, we can take our existing infrastructure and really leverage it to provide more care. Thank you. Ram. So imagine waking up in the morning, not feeling too well and a bit, something is out. So you walk over to the bathroom, look at the mirror and says, Gail, how am I doing? And an image appears on the mirror that says, hi Ram, um, it looks like your temperature is a little bit up because we have an infrared sensor built into the mirror. And by the way, the display technology to overlay an artificial image using augmented reality on top of a mirror exists today, like Samsung Display Group, when I was there, showed it to me. And by the way, we've tracked your sleep at night using a ballistic cardiogram sensor that's under your mattress. Again, technology that exists today uh, by a company called Early Sense. So we know that we've actually seen irregular heartbeat during your sleep, and your sleep cycles were completely messed up. So as you're talking over there, you can say, Gail, can you connect me to the doctor? And you have a telehealth session with your doctor who can view all of the information that was collected about you overnight, <coughs> talk to you, and give you the first level of uh, response. Uh, you know, just it, you have a cold, don't worry about it. These technologies are happening. It's not going to be 2017. But by the next four or five years, these things are coming together, and that's what I'm working on. Um, and it's going to mean a very, very different kind of healthcare on the edge. What does it mean? What's the business model behind it? 
what are the services that can be provided. That's what we'll dive deeper later on. We will. Thank you. Nicolas. So I, I was, uh, for the last 20 years, uh, up to a couple of years ago, uh, leading, building, creating the healthcare part of McKinsey, which I thought was, was fascinating. I have an operations research background, but I really, really liked healthcare. And um, you probably have talked a lot about healthcare. And what I find exciting about technology, digitization, and data is that for the first time, we have the hope to change healthcare. So for the, had, had I given this talk here five years ago, 10 years ago maybe, I would have said the usual things, which is uh, a new president comes into the White House, he will find there is no money for the next 100 years, because the, net, uh, the, un, uh, the uh, committed, the committed but not yet funded um, um, the, uh, obligation of the US government for healthcare is minus by now $78 trillion. You will please note that the entire US economy is worth about plus $42 trillion, so there is a small problem. Uh, because uh, if you wish, the Americans are th about 30 times worse off than Greece when it comes to funding healthcare. Um, so, so they need to do something. And over the last years, we have uh, essentially, uh, for the first time, seen that we actually can do something, which is uh, we can put machine learning into healthcare payments with that probably risk stratify, with that probably change payments. We have done this now in 11 countries. Um, Sometimes with 300 people, sometimes like 300 different payers or providers, sometimes with, in the case of Germany, for example, 70,000 doctors to be involved. And we can essentially risk stratify uh, payments, um, and um, we can, on the back of that, actually really measure you know, uh, healthcare, healthcare quality, healthcare outcomes, which Michael Porter and others have written theoretical books about, have never really gotten it done, but we can now get it done. And that's, that's, that's the reason why in so many countries where this is being applied, um, uh, the, the, the cost curve is, is beginning to shift. And then McKinsey thought, um, this sounds great, Nicholas, but you know, if you have 200 people in healthcare doing 200 geeks and 200 translators doing all this great work, why don't you do this across all of McKinsey? So I've just changed my job because I think technology is so exciting. And I'm now heading McKinsey Analytics where we hire 3,000 people, build a platform, do 70 partnerships, just seven acquisitions. I'm also the chairman of Quantum Black, which is, uh, some of you might see this afternoon, Formula One, which is the operating platform, the machine learning operating platform, and the leading team, Mercedes, which helps Mercedes to outlearn Ferrari. And, and if you apply that to another problem, for example, um, um, you, you might have heard yesterday that the pharmaceutical innovation model is obviously broken. Most people think um, the whole you know, <coughs> classical science model is broken. Putting machine learning into that, you can fundamentally you know, find new targets. Uh, we have, uh, you can predict three years before a trial is done whether it will be one year late or not, just by the email traffic of the team. Uh, so, so we can do things which we couldn't do before, and technology is not the problem anymore. And, and the mission, I think, uh, we, we have to do together is um, um, putting more and more of, this, of the things which now are possible, like harvesting data, it's, uh, building data lakes, putting this into the real action of healthcare. That's, that's a very exciting mission. And that's happening today. It's not kind of in five years. I think I'd like to talk a bit about artificial intelligence because I feel like it's the sort of underpinning of pretty much every technological innovation in the next um, few years. Um, but obviously, it's, it's turning into a bit of a utility, uh, like water or electricity or Wi-Fi. We're going to sort of stream AI in theory. Um, just as we uh, stream those other utilities. What do you think that's going to open up? Perhaps we could start with, with Graham on that. What, what potential do you think that that sort of cheap machine learning, the cheap AI, could do to really transform um, healthcare using some examples of things that you've seen? I think um, it, it's interesting. You know, if you look at computing, we've gone through many, many waves, you know, starting off with basic tabulating machines, then going to programmatic uh, systems, and now we're in cognitive or AI. And you know, um, I remember when I was at university many years ago, AI was around then. Then mm. it kind of went into deep cryogenic sleep, yep. and it and has come back out of there. And I think it's found a whole new life, really, in helping us understand how to make sense and discern patterns from the amount of data that's now available. You know, it is the advent of big data or the rediscovery of big data, which is primarily driven by a whole load of things like the massively falling price of chips 
uh, ubiquity of the internet, uh, universal standards to share, uh, and the rise of sensors and actuators in, you know, leading to the IoT, Internet of Things devices. And all this ends up with massive data, and particularly clinicians um, and people in healthcare. There is so much work going on globally and so many sources of information that I think um, help is needed. And as, as you said, AI gives people an assistant. It helps assist people to do things, and it helps you see things that you cannot see. Um, to people who are not involved in either IT or, um, or uh, medicine, I basically explain it can do for uh, medicine basically what the, the microscope did. It enables you to see things that you couldn't see with yep. the naked eye and pick out new detail and new patterns. I mean, it was really interesting. I was, if I can say this word here, I was at Imperial the other day, and they were showing me, it's a place south of here. Um, it's, um, they were showing me in, the, in a wall a display of uh, images, the, the Twitter feeds for the last three months before Brexit. And if you'd looked at that, you could see what was gonna happen mm. with Brexit. But nobody really paid any attention to that. We still did the old fashioned exit polls and we talked mm. to pundits who never moved outside central London. Um, and the other display, which was really interesting there, they showed me is a um, real life display of Bitcoin transactions globally. And these things look like starbursts all around. And then suddenly, using uh, machine learning algorithms, you can discern different patterns. And these actually end up looking quite organic in shape. And you can see that visually and you can pull it out with AI, but you could never do that just looking at tabular data or, mm. with, or tra tra traditional systems. So I think it's going to be really, really, well, it is now becoming really important in helping us make sense of the data, helping us see new patterns. And I think, you know, the virtual assistant here is going to be really important. Mm. You know, in certain areas of the world, we are very blessed with deep talent, but in other areas, there's a paucity of talent. And so we're going to have to supplement this talent with really clever IT, and AI has a very strong role to play in that. So that's kind of my view of where it's going here. And speaking of very clever IT, Jishan, what, tell us about your <laughs> superhuman, um, you know, super robots that you're, yeah. you're, you're building to help turbocharge that. So I mean, when people, I think when people think of AI, they think of like these futuristic things that are going to, like th there's a lot we can do that's incredibly exciting in terms of new things like drug discovery with AI. But in medicine, we already know a lot of the things that we should do. Like we already know what we should be doing, but we're not doing it. And the most obvious example, and it's embarrassing as a doctor, is checklists. We don't use checklists. They're stupidly easy to use. But if you try and go into an OR and get a surgeon to fill out a checklist, <laughs> he'll say, no effing way. I'm, I'm too busy to do this. And now we're at the point where it's like, you know what? Go and do what you're doing. I don't need you to fill out the checklist anymore. I'm going to have a machine or assistant watch what's happening, fill in the checklist automatically, and when I do... And, when the system notices, and the system is always watching, it's not going to fail, it's not going to go on break, notices that there isn't DBT prophylaxis or the antibiotic isn't given, um, it can then alert the team or notify the team. And there's no, the great thing about it, there's no blame there. There's no, you don't require people to put, enter any more data. And so I'm really excited about how AI can make us do what we're already supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, and like, it, it, it's mainly around this assistant, but like, mm. the idea of superhuman is like, there's things that humans are good at and there's things that we're really bad at. And fortunately, in the areas that we're really bad, what is first coming out in AI is what, th that overlaps very well with what a machine can do very mm. well. Yeah, and, and so, frees up the human to be more human in, exactly. that, in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ram, do you want to tell us what this might mean for taking um, healthcare out of the hospital scenario or out of the, uh, the labs? I know you're building a sort of remote, uh, a remote medical um, provision. Um, yeah, let me do this, but before that I want to give a specific example mm. of what you were talking about. It is startup based in Houston, Texas. And basically they connected to, in the NICU, connected all of their real-time sensors, including the pulse ox, to a centralized software that they have. And they started looking at all of the data, the O2, the heart rate, the shape of how the pulses look uh, on the different babies. And as a result of doing some machine learning and data crunching, they are able to recognize clinically, and they've run clinical studies on it, a code blue five minutes before it happens. Mm. So that's literally using AI to save lives. They will give a warning to a nurse saying, we are seeing 
a certain symptoms here and the data that you need to go and check on this baby. And for me, this is just an amazing example of what we can do with AI. Uh, let put aside, what I'm working on is we are seeing all of those innovations happening and all of those sensors and devices. What we've been working on is saying, you know, on the edge, uh, we need to bring the healthcare to the edge. And the mirror might be happening five years from now, but what we are working now is let's create portable clinics that you can go and put them in small town, in small villages, in some people who have high risk at home. So basically, she convinced me to bring it over. We have something like this that has all of the guides on how to deal with healthcare. It's a telehealth tab tablet, so I can go and talk to a doctor or a nurse remotely. Inside here, I have the latest sensors from a whole group of people in the industry. So we have optical biosense, uh, biomarkers, so I can take a bit of blood and do lipid, and that's going for a startup in FDA evaluation next year. So basic blood testing, stethoscope, pulse oxygen, camera, urine testing, and if that's not exciting enough, this is an ultrasound device built by another company that's being controlled by this. So if you think about, okay, I have all of those things in here, I have a specific guide here with video, audio, interactive. I can now take and give this to a 20-year-old high school graduate, diligent, thoughtful, responsible, but not necessarily with any health education. And they can go and put the stethoscope in the right places. They can put the ECG, which we're also looking at the right place, collect the information, talk to the doctor remotely because the doctor is still essential and help diagnose. And that's fundamentally affecting the whole economics of delivering healthcare on the edge. And obviously interesting questions about, about regulating devices that we, we, we looked at earlier, which we can talk about in a moment. Nicholas, do you want to say something on the, on the analytics yeah. Uh, front? Yeah, I'd, I'd just straight back to your question. I just wanted to illustrate with two examples how we would traditionally... Now, at McKinsey, we work on some of the world's hardest problems with one of the world's most difficult people, which is the CEOs of very, very, you know, <laughs> very, very self-confident people. They think they, you know, they know what they're doing. You, you and, said it, not me. Yeah. And uh, so, so, for example, uh, in probably the, one of the most highly performing uh, clinical trial organizations in the world, where lots of talent comes in the industry from, um, they basically said, couldn't we make this better? And they said, Nicholas, you have worked here for 10 years. How could we possibly make it any better after all this? And then traditionally, we would have, thought, for example, said, OK, uh, we would like to you know, do a lot of interviews. Then we do maybe two or three statistical analysis on the data a day. And, and then uh, we would uh, more find uh, some process which could be changed. Um, what we did in this particular example, we, we took data from 65 sources from all sorts of finance data, HR data, um, you know, x-rays, um, clinical data, investigator data, country data, and so on, about 90 terabyte. And um, put it all together, tagged it, and then basically try to predict uh, which, uh, based on uh, past evidence, which trial is going to be late. And what we found is single biggest correlation um, of uh, a delay in trial is uh, each team in a, a large clinical trial is about 20 people. Um, they have the same three roles, um, always the same three roles, and their collaboration behavior determines up to one year delay in a trial. One year delay in a trial is a very significant event. Why did we find this? Because we could do literally millions of calculations a day rather than three a day. That's, that's, and we would be, nobody's ever, the CEO of this company is probably the most esteemed person in the industry. He has done this for 20 years, I have worked on this for 20 years. He's never thought of that. And we can measure this collaboration behavior of these three people on a single metric, which is the sentiment of their email. So if they shout at each other, we rank basically them from uncollaborative to collaborative based on the email content. Regulator then said, you can, you're not allowed to do that, so we now use uh, calendar analysis. But nobody had ever thought about at that, you know, you need to find which three people, you need to find how much uh, this is worth and so on. And that's what machine learning is. And when you say then AI on top, um, 
AI, I think I would, the difference between machine learning and AI, in my view, is uh, if, if you then begin to uh, write code which corrects itself. So all models like people age, um, like this model, for example, predicting uh, collaboration would age over time because people you know, would strike back and they would s say nice things in emails to each other in order to not be <coughs> found out. And um, so you need to kind of, the model needs to keep learning. And AI, I think, is, is a piece of code which then keeps, keeps this going. Uh, another good example, much quicker, is um, in, the, in the past, we tried to do with all sorts of clinical evidence the uh, studies and so on uh, to predict certain things. For example, um, we try to predict in the past, there's lots of clinical research, uh, lots of work going on, on predicting who is going to have an emergency visit, um, what risk factor, and so on. It took us about, on, on all the Israeli data, four million data sets on Clarit data, it took us about one week to basically uh, be even in predictive power with all clinical evidence ever created. So we used all, all code ever created, all code ever written at GitHub, and we put an algorithm on top to optimize that code, uh, so the code would write itself, and we used all data ever published um, in all medical journals ever, ever published, and it took a week, roughly, of a little bit playing around, uh, and basically we were uh, as predictive as all clinical research ever existing. It took then another week to beat that four times. So we had a four times lift over all clinical evidence, all clinical research I ever created in a week. And what they all forgot is loneliness. Uh, if people feel lonely, emotionally lonely, they, it, they, um, it's one of the factors they, uh, uh, we found, uh, particularly in this particular data set. It was a, uh, and we added that to all the other risk factors like certain chronic diseases and so on. We could predict essentially a person of uh, with an emergency visit going to happen in a month's time, much higher. Now, when, when you can predict that, and of, of course you can also prevent it. Yeah. It's a great example of um, how you can essentially, you know, basically <coughs> do clinical research without doing clinical research, which is uh, potentially, when you think about your career as clinical uh, academics, um, make sure you put some data science into your, your toolbox, because without that, basically you can't do much a few years from now. Jishan, do you want to respond to that and then Ram? Uh, I just mean I, overall, like I know it sounds like, I think we, we all qualify as like AI cheerleaders on the panel and like I strongly believe in the power of AI. But there's also like, because of that power, um, concern around, I mean basically, you know, AI is being built on data. Whoever has the most data is gonna be able to have the best predictive systems and that's going to put a lot of power in the hands of very few people. And so there's a lot of questions I think we need to ask along the same side of like, how are these data sets open? Um, because the, the technology will progress outside of healthcare. But the question is like, if we have companies like ours, which is doing this, which is like creating proprietary data sets that no one else can look at, um, how, what does that mean? Like what kind of power does that give our company over others? And then the, the other aspect of it is like, how does that in, in scale up the biases that we already have? Because I use, I use humans to train my machines but I know my humans are biased. And like one of the best examples is that in the emergency room, if it's a white patient or a black patient in the same clinical condition, the white patient's gonna get more analgesia than the black patient. And I know that by training my system on these humans, my machine's gonna do the same, same thing. And that's incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that would then be applied to a much bigger scale. So while AI is also very, like, very exciting, I think there's a lot of fundamental questions around, okay, who owns this data? How open is this data set? And then, in terms of these black boxes that we're building, how are we sure that we're not magnifying a lot of problems that we already have mm -hmm. and not using them to actually correct for them? And yeah. so, I mean, I pose those as open questions and something that we, we think about often is that how do we keep the data open and how do we make it so that we correct for biases and not uh, amplify, amplify them? them. Yeah. Absolutely. Ram. You gave two fascinating, very different examples of AI and I'm going to push it a bit to the extreme just to be controversial. One was the Clalit example, which is, by the way, governments that have centralized healthcare have amazing amount of useful data. The Clalit database, I know it, it, it's the central healthcare organization in Israel. And being able to go and sit down on this data is one of the most amazing opportunities to do research mm -hmm. and really find ways to, okay, here's my algorithm, here are my predictions, and prove that you can do something. But the second example is, I think, where AI should not be used. Because if you have a CEO who needs 
an AI algorithm to tell him that his teams are not communicating properly and he has a one year delay, he should not be the CEO. He should be walking down on the floor, talking to his team, communicating with the team, having an all hands meeting, telling them you need to have open communication. I want to have bad news early. That's about setting the culture of the organization, how people behave, and that not, should not be AI driven. So I'm taking it to the extreme, but uh, it's something that we all need to keep in mind is where is AI doing the stuff that none of us could ever do, like what you said about the Clalit, versus, oh, I'm using AI, this is comfort, but it's an uh, improper replacement for a human interaction. Can I just come back to that? Please, that's, yeah. that's a, a big ethical challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, Team UK wouldn't have won 85% of the gold medals in cycling they have targeted, mm -hmm. hadn't they used AI, but they use it on very, very soft things. You know, for example, all the team members in the UK who are cycling have a vertical lung. Uh, if you don't have a vertical lung, you can't be uh, getting not even sponsorship for it. And but, but how do you learn these things? You learn that with with, with machine learning. And, and I think that there is a question on. Um, indeed, a big ethical question on how far do you go in order to drive performance um, uh, using these kind of techniques. So, so let me, um, let me this, this is leading us, I think, to some very interesting questions around um, social acceptability, um, equality, and, uh, and all of those issues here. Um, I, uh, on the open data sets, it's one of the reasons I passionately believe we need a National Institute for Medical Informatics because I want the data from the 60 million people to be analyzed as an amazing cohort like no other in the world in one system, and then in real time feed the knowledge back into the NHS. The goal here is patient outcomes, better patient outcomes. So that's the, that's the goal of why we want to do that, just to stop the privatization or the ghettoization of some of these small areas. The other point you raised, which is a really important one, is who trains the AI? <laughs> And, you know, one of the things we learned with Watson is you just let it go. You try and pour as much information as you can in a particular area, like oncology, and soak up as much information as you can, and don't let it be just one person doing the filtering before you put it into the machine. And then you come to the point that says, okay, is this only going to be used by people who've got the money to pay? Is this going to be high-end systems or not? But on the other hand, if I look at your, um, your example um, you gave where we have these sensors that can monitor people's health in real time, that makes a fantastic difference. You know, and I wear one of these idiot bracelets to tell me I'm still alive, but I need to move more to prove it. Um, the, important thing, the important thing here is that with the Internet of Things, we do not want a trillion alerts being sent to GPs. GPs already have thousands of patients. They have no bandwidth to deal with these alerts. So I believe AI has an important role to act as a triage, at least. And then you can get personalized triage that knows your basic system state. And then only the real exceptions get sent to the GP. You know, and that way, we can scale health a little better than we can now. But what we need to make sure is that you know, we don't ghettoize data. We don't actually make it only uh, the very, very rich who can have access to this. Um, and you know, your comment right at the beginning about the cost of healthcare, ironically, I believe the only way we can reduce the cost of healthcare is with more IT. Um, you know, IT in the healthcare at the moment just means you know, another trip to PC world and mm. throw in some more computers that are 20 years out of date and it's a real awful, awful state. Um, we need to be a lot more thoughtful about it. And, and your comment was absolutely right on that people training today have to have this, this skill. Mm. You know, the data scientist is a new global skill, and the medical data scientist is a subset of that that's really, really important. Uh, Can we talk a bit about skills, actually? Because skills and sort of leadership is something I, I think is really interesting in the face of these accelerating yeah. technologies and things that you might have learned in business school or medical school or at Oxford or whatever you know, aren't necessarily in 20 or 30 or 40 years' time going to prepare you for the reality of, of life when we've got sensors in every crevice and God knows what else going on as well. <laughs> and 
I think that's a really, I, mean, I don't know if you, were, you heard um, Zoe McDougall at <coughs> Oxford Nanopore yesterday saying that you know, people at home might have a genetic sequencer or even their hoover might have a genetic sequencer in it that can sequence right. you know, yeah. what we're hoovering up as a sort of strange sort of science fiction kind of view um, that we, we have there. But I'm interested in, in you know, I'm, I'm actually going out to LA tomorrow to take a, a new type of genetic test that does your epigenetics as well. And I'm sort of sadistically a bit excited about taking the readout to my GP and asking her what she thinks I should do. And it's a bit of a poke in the sense that it's clear that we have absolutely no idea what that means or if it's even a well, thing. And so I'd be interested in what the panel thinks about leadership and, and, and skills, not just in CEOs of big companies, but also for entrepreneurs, for, for regulators, for physicians. Um, and are we, are we training the right, are we training people with the right skills? Well, um, it, the, the, the quick answer here is no. Um, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, in, in, if you look at our lives today, all of us are going to, going to have to get reskilled radically three times, I think, in, in yep. the average lifespan um, because of the rate and pace of technology. And the technology is not going to slow down. Yeah. You know, medical uh, processes and trials are actually going to speed up, even though it doesn't seem like it. Um, but they are going to have to do that. And we're going to have to make some really big choices. And I think that the real challenge is how do we have the dialogue with the public? How do we have that dialogue in a way that people can make an informed uh, decision about the choices? And, you know, in, in the UK, consent is a big thing. Mm -hmm. You know, what, who can look at the data? Uh, and it's really, really important. If it's a private health system, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. You know, you sign up and the, the health uh, insurer owns your data. Mm -hmm. In the NHS, no, the, you know, that data is still private. Um, mm -hmm. It would be very easy to say if you want to be treated by the NHS, that you hereby give permission for your data to be used for bona fide medical purposes. Mm. That may be a very quick and easy way out of it, I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of work that's gone on there. But people are very, very suspicious of this, and we have to be very, very careful, um, mm. because the media are not good, generally speaking, about giving um, a balanced view on this. No, um, you know, they have a job to do, which is sell copy, yep. um, not necessarily inform. Jason, did you want to comment on sort of skills and, and leadership? Yeah, I mean, like when, when in, in medicine, when we first got x-rays, it started off as this fringe thing, but then it became so, so important that it evolved into the field of radiology, and it's its own specialty, and it's this underpinning of much of what we do. And we're slowly seeing that with informatics, like now there are informatics fellowships, but not to the same degree in just the basic training, both for, like on both ends of the stethoscope, so for both for the patient as well as the provider. It's like, like inf your information is incredibly important to your care. And we don't teach medical students and we don't teach patients. Like, what's the obligations and responsibilities and potential mm -hmm. of dealing just with information? Like, I find it incredible that our profession is so, like, you can't do anything unless you have the right information. Um, and yet we talk very little bit about how we manage information, how we use it, what the, what the consent around it is. Um, and that, that needs to change very, very quickly. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure how we, how we get there because it's still very slow. Um, just to change tack before we open it up to the floor, because I'm sure there's some questions uh, here. I'm kind of interested in, in how perhaps the, the two of you think about how this price performance curve is coming down or going up, depending on how you look at it, um, in lots of other technologies, whether that's virtual reality or robotics or any other um, of, these, of these sort of accelerating technologies. How are, you, how are you thinking about that, perhaps you, Nicolaus, in terms of where where you're pointing your 3,000 brains that you have in your, in your team now uh, to think about what might be coming next? Let me just yes, hit do, yeah. quickly on the, on yep. the talent thing, um, um, which I think is the biggest bottleneck we have right now. Um, and it took us uh, two years, but now we are done at McKinsey. We have basically uh, changed seven, created seven new career tracks. Just to give you, I mean, half of our people will have different career tracks than we had two years ago. So, uh, which is, you can become a very senior person in a consulting firm by writing code and have a senior client. That's a pretty revolutionary Thing. But I think the, 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 the key thing is, um, from my point of view, not so much um, just to scale up certain types of skills, but to make them talk to each other. So we are basically, if you think about computer science, data, and mathematics, math medicine, and business and leadership as four, as a Venn diagram, the key thing are the people at the intersections who make, who we call translators. So we are tra creating this year 5,000 translators just in McKinsey with 1 million hours of training just to, to make the bridges between the deep experts, the Nobel Prize winning scientists or whatever, and the, mm. and the kind of organizational ch change experts and business leaders. 
without this bridge building, um, I think it's, um, it, it's going to be very hard. And if I were a, a university designing curricula today, and if I or mm. I would completely rethink the whole thing uh, which, which currently is being done. I think it's completely outdated to, to just learn textbooks and you know, learn all chemistry and biology and so on to become a doctor. I think we need a much more multidisciplinary and batch-based education system actually to correspond with the future talent needs. Mm. On, the, on the curve, I think the short answer is, I'll just so much time speaking now, it's, it's exponentially going up. I yeah. think the next 10 years uh, we will see in a lot of these technologies further significant increases in, in what we can do. I don't think technology is at all for the next decade the limiting factor. Um, for, for making changes. Yeah, it's the humans. Graham, did you want to comment on that before I throw it open to the floor? Yeah. Um, and I'd love to hear your comment on my comment. Um, <laughs> if we look back in history in healthcare, we basically had a doctor uh, providing a small care to a village. And if we look at the total amount of care a human received in his lifetime, let's say it's something about this size. As we moved through the 20th century, the total amount of care got bigger. We started seeing some specialization, and we started seeing layers around it, like the different types of nurses. As we live longer and longer, and we have more sophisticated ways of dealing with healthcare, the total amount of healthcare received, especially in the end of life stages, is getting much, much bigger. The problem is, that we can't have the same growth in the total cost of healthcare over an individual life. The solution to some extent is when we look at the healthcare the way we are moving, it needs to rely much more on technology. Technology will never replace the doctor because when it comes to healthcare, you still need a doctor in the center looking at your eyes, being able to be the, the way you call it, a translator who can connect the different expertise, who have the empathy and can, can care for you. But there is a huge role for technology, and this is technology from a whole slew of different vendors because technology is where we can have the cost savings. If we looked at the mobile technology industry, and what was done in computing 30 years ago, and what it costs to do 100 times more for 100 times less today, yeah. the technology gives us the opportunity to start lowering the mm -hmm. costs. And that's kind of the physics of the industry and how it's moving. You have to run into a lot of problems with incumbent processes and incumbent uh, players in healthcare, in hospitals, which makes it much, much harder to move. Uh, that's why I also foresee a lot of the innovation happening outside of the hospitals, because that's where you don't have existing processes uh, and incumbent players. But that's kind of the, if, if I had to draw a map of how the industry is shifting, is uh, the technology will be used to lower the costs, and it will mostly happen outside of the hospital because you don't have the incumbent player. Which is the same disruption story that you're seeing pretty much across every industry, right? From finance to, to the car industry to whatever. It's, it's very unusual that the source of disruption comes from, from that industry itself. It tends to come from a kind of external source. But anyway, I, w I really want to talk about external sources. Um, I'd like to throw it open to the audience to see if anyone uh, has got a question. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of questions, so. A few questions. Yeah. It's fine. Um, because I found it really intriguing that uh, you did this massive data set analysis and what you discovered was that people were lonely. Um, and it's a little bit ironic in the context of this panel because whilst we talk about training loads more technicians, I wonder who are the people who are human who connect with the those of us that are lonely and the more fundamental did so you want to take that next? I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make, and uh, I couldn't go too much into detail of, of, of the particular piece, the, the point I was trying to make is, with this kind of approach, you can actually quantify um, how much loneliness the, or the feeling of loneliness adds to other risk factors such as chronic diseases and certain other pieces which are well known. 
And uh, the, the only point I was making is that we couldn't find in the existing clinical research literature uh, this particular risk factor as a significant uh, lift. Uh, because most of the clinicians thought about diseases and not about you know, states of mind, so to speak, to measure. That's, that's the only thing. And um, I could have given a completely different example. For example, if you want to find copper, um, you need to think about where the lightnings are. You know, that is something which wasn't known a year ago, but it's now known. <laughs> and uh, because we can link uh, uh, geological data to weather data now. So I'm, I'm just saying the machine, uh, large data set analysis uh, opens up the opportunity to, to look beyond where humans have hypotheses or biases. That's the, that's the main point. I guess there's a good point I'm making is that it already is the case that the technician, the doctor, diagnostic problems and therapeutic problems overlook something as beyond the plane of the obvious as solitude as a risk factor. Then training even more capable technicians, like maybe I see to a world where you know, we miss the things that yeah. are right in front of our eyes. And it, be pleased to know that this uh, thing wasn't done with lots of people. It was actually done by the machine itself. So I, I think there's an interesting point right, that I heard from, from Lord Turner um, the other day when he was asked about um, uh, jobs in the face of automation. And he said that instead of a universal basic income, coming up with a way to actually pay the humans, particularly in healthcare, for example, the nursing staff, the caring staff, <laughs> whatever, actually a great deal more than we currently pay would be a better solution perhaps than a universal basic income kind of solution for that kind of... Uh, for, the, for the inevitability of, of the kind of automation of lots of, of people's jobs. Because for me, and I don't know what you think about this, um, Graham, in terms of IBM Watson and things, but, but it's, it's the human and the machine that's the powerful combination. You know, you don't want to just go to a machine and be, be diagnosed with no, right. something. There's a trust gap between me believing that that's actually the case and it's not just having a short circuit day or something. Um, but there's also the fact that you don't want to be looked after by a machine. It's a bit of an absurdity to be looked after and sort of cared for by a machine. Anyway, moving on to another question. Where, where have we, Abdul, with the mic. Thanks. So as you guys know, I'm a bit of a technology skeptic. And um, <clears throat> I work in a city in the United States where 40% uh, of our city doesn't have internet access at all. Um, they all have mobile technology. Uh, so there's text, but that's about it. Um, and so I guess my, my question to the panel is, how do you democratize this, this tech future uh, in a way that not only gives equal access to technology to folks, but does the work of helping us to fill the gap? Uh, because what tends to happen with a lot of these things is that we assume a platform, and then we adjust to where we assume the platform has gone. And so folks who haven't reached that platform are just forgotten in the next phase. Um, and so how do, we, how do we address that? And uh, do you feel like it's in the tech innovation itself, it's in the regulation or uh, the governance of tech, uh, or somewhere different that I'm not thinking about? Who wants to take that? I can take that. Or do you shine talk to him? I, mean, I, I, think, I think the easiest answer is to get to the point where you eliminate the scarcity and there's just so much more abundance where it's not, not, not even a question anymore. Um, that, 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 in an abstract sense, that's easy to say, but um, in those areas where we're, where we're underserving in terms of access to technology, I, 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 I mean, we can do as much as we want on policy, but it really just needs to bring the cost down. And so whether that's uh, incentives or regulations or whatever it may be that just pushes the cost down, I think we just need to create, transform scarcity into abundance. I, I think we're... Where I would say I have another fear on that is what, where we've tried to transform scarcity and abundance. You have people like, I mean, we've gotten two or three offers from uh, large internet providers who say, yeah, we would gladly provide your folks internet um, if it means that we can advertise whatever we want to them 24-7. Well, like Facebook did in India and got thrown out for doing so. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I guess the question of that, that, that's even more pernicious than not having the technology to begin with. So I hear you, like, it's not, it's not actually a scarcity problem, it's a coordination problem. Um, and so I, I guess my question is, if you're talking about, if you add the, the ad, added ethical and moral uh, contingency of now doing healthcare uh, or providing something that's a critical good via technology, um, does that change the, the calculus there? Or uh, you know, should we be willing to have people force-fed uh, advertisements so that they can get very basic needs? I mean, like. Giving, it, giving internet to people with advertisements is not scarcity to abundance. It's just transferring the way you're making them to pay for it. Like they're not paying with dollars, they're paying with their attention and you're, you're commoditizing the person. Um, so 
I, I still think that, I mean, uh, for me, I, the, and maybe this is because I'm a tech evangelist, but like, I think the best, the biggest bang for the buck is to reduce the cost, the fundamental cost of those things. Another question. Um, oh, okay. Just a specific example for this, Abdul. I was in a healthcare facility in Saskatchewan uh, four weeks ago, and we were talking about telehealth to the rural communities, and they basically showed me a 10-inch tablet built by a medical company to provide basic telehealth, and the cost for this was about $25,000. I showed them Gale, it basically provides almost identical functionality, with the cost being about uh, one hundredth of the cost. Uh, and that goes not just to technology being able to reduce the cost, it also goes to the incumbent existing processes in medical, uh, you know, it needs to be fully class two certified, I have to be approved by the hospital, I'm a, the existing vendors, it took me two years to get all the paperwork done without any typos, versus a, a much more open industry where you can get in, innovate, get the products much faster. Mm. But of course, you've got to be careful not to be the fake bed nets of the precision medicine world either. So, on that note, should we have a? Oh, sorry, we've got a question actually over here first, Agnes. Uh, I work with commercialized technology at the university and working with the hospitals to try to think about uh, how to use digital health and machine learning to uh, have, realize some cost savings. One of the areas we focus on is patient dispatching in a more intelligent way to keep patients at home. And eventually, it lies about the last book, but it's just about that. really weigh in and have much better outcomes. We just deploy existing off-the-shelf point-of-care diagnostics right in front of the hospital. When the patients would show up, we'd say, you come, you stay away. You come, you stay away. With six metrics that we already know about. And to me, what this points out is today, digital health, technology innovation for the healthcare sector really hasn't brought about cost decreases. All this has been added to the current system. I think part of that is reflective of if you look at the state and the structure of the market, all of the, all of the incentives are really for these companies to sell more. And the marginal, that marginal incentive is you're always going to get more from selling, and the companies don't really benefit from the cost savings. So if it's structurally organized in a way that doesn't have any incentives, why is digital health different? Nicholas is going to take that one. <laughs> well, I think the, the, the fundamental issue uh, you are laying out is the one of incentives, and I think the main the main issue is uh, most healthcare in, uh, around the world is tax funded and paid for by the state, including the United States, where they have a sixty percent state funded system and a private system on top of it, um, and. The way the system is set up uh, encourages essentially innovation to be um, um, added um, and, and particular costly innovation to be added. And I think the, the, the main reason for that is that most countries have a pretty dumb approach to buying healthcare. Uh, the way that they try to outsource uh, the cost of training their doctors on new innovative things uh, to factor to the industry. Uh, which comes in form of sales reps. 40% uh, of a life sciences company's um, uh, revenue would go for marketing and selling, and that's basically, you know, seeing doctors trying to convince them of a project, uh, product and telling them how this molecule works and stuff like that. And that is the main channel, other than medical journals, which most doctors don't read. Um, that's the main channel uh, with which uh, medical information is actually shared around, and um, otherwise you have to rely on, on what doctors learn in university, which outdates pretty fast. And uh, then there is some continuous medical education, most of that is funded by industry as well. So if you wanted to change that, uh, the f you needed to get the health systems into uh, essentially teaching their own 
uh, staff, um, private or public, doesn't matter, it's the same thing, uh, about innovation. Uh, you would need to be a much smarter commissioner for innovation. You would need to include technology uh, into, into that. Um, you know, 10 years from now, most drugs will be built molecule and data combinations. They will not be just molecules. Um, and in that world, I think uh, the, the whole way how um, essentially countries buy healthcare uh, probably needs to shift quite a bit. Well, what this country is trying to do, I was just talking with Andrew Dillon on Friday about it. He's the head of the uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence at NICE, mm -hmm. which 73 countries use as their <coughs> benchmarking tool of what is deemed okay versus not. And uh, he, he is self-aware that he is under-investing into this field. So, so, so I think we need to get more um, attention spent by organizations like NICE on what could be saved by disruptive technologies, et cetera, et cetera, uh, rather than just approving new drugs. It's, it's a very, very fundamental thing. That would be a, from a record. So if, if you were, uh, you know, this government, unfortunately, is not very smart because they cut NICE's budgets all the time. They should add some budget to NICE to specifically help them to identify savings on behalf of the system. That would be a, a, a pretty good thing. Let, let, me, give you um, a, let uh, me give you a quick example of, of very basic technology that's saving a lot of money. Um, the records are available from NICE about when drugs come off patent, that basically GPs are given an, an alert to say you should now start prescribing the non-patented drugs, okay? A piece of work was done here in Oxford that looked at the decay curve between when they were notified and when action was taken by GPs. Massive difference, <coughs> days to years. If you just took the major drugs for arthritis, you could save probably 10 million in every week in prescriptions. And this is not advanced technology, this is just making use of straightforward analytics on data that's become available. And it's a very simple thing to do. And it's going to be lots of incremental things like that, and not necessarily the amazing things. Doing what we should already be doing. Yeah, your point earlier on the checklist, you know, they ran a study in Portsmouth in the hospitals there. The checklists were, used to be on paper and they got not filled in, or they, nobody understood them, or they put yeah. it upside down. They replaced those with iPads. Patient outcomes were improved dramatically just because the checklist and everybody could see what was happening. So some very simple points, but what it does depend upon is the people who are using it are consulted. The technology is not pushed onto them. <laughs> that the problem is really well understood, and that actually all clinicians are sensitised and trained to the technology that's available here, um, because there are so many easy savings that could be made, as well as the more expensive. Um, problems to, to be addressed. The other thing that I think gives me hope is we heard this morning about, you know, the long period of time for drugs, uh, you know, discovery, etc., and before the price comes down, the decay curve is much, much faster in IT. Yeah. <laughs> things come, things go, they get commoditized much, much faster. So I think that the rollout of technology is going to be much, much faster and the price is going to come down that's going to help with the democratization. But we've all got to understand consciously what we're doing. And that's why I'm really, really passionate about having a proper public debate so people can make the right informed choices. If, if and only if we have open systems. Because like Stanford's <laughs> Children's Hospital spent $1.4 billion on their EMR. It's like $80,000 per bed. Like it should not cost that much. And it only can cost that yeah. much because it's closed systems and they can basically yeah. just yeah. extract as much rent out of it as possible. And, and, and so, 80% of that is change costs. 80% is people running around the hospital training up people. A third is, uh, well, only one sixth of that is technology. So uh, one other point to add to it, <laughs> and, and actually an organization that does it well. In the US, you see a lot of PPOs, where the incentive is pay per transaction. So sure, they're going to maximize the amount of money they can make, and they have no incentive to really cut it. HMOs, and, and a ex specific example here I would say is Kaiser in the US, has been fantastic in adapting new technology, bringing them in. 
and trying to lower the costs because for them it's about maximizing the user, the uh, utility of the care and the satisfaction of the customer at the lowest cost. So integrated organizations like this in the US have been much more successful and I think a much better model for care. Now the other thing that on the individual level that anybody who deals with healthcare needs to understand is our behavior toward health is fundamentally irrational. So go and read any of the book like uh, Irrationality um, in, in uh, both in economics and in healthcare. Uh, Professor Dan Ariely is one of the leading ones who have been written about it. But when you start understanding how we postpone treatments, how we don't want treatments, how we want treatments that has no relationship to value, that helps you understand why when you are sick you're actually going and screaming and pushing for treatments that might have no added value but extreme high costs. And that's one of the other side of the fundamentals for the cost in the industry. I'm going to have to jump in there before I get flashed one more time by the, the, the cards at the front. Um, thank you guys very much indeed for uh, doing that. I did actually ask each of the panel to prepare um, what their moonshot, what their idea of the next um, uh, 10 years or so would be to watch. Um, we don't have time to go through that now, but do come and find them each because they'll have that up their sleeve to share with you guys. So thank you very much indeed, everyone. Thank you.